Um, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for, for Alumni in the Arts, Galleries and Gavels. We're pleased to welcome you to the second edition of panel discussions sponsored by the Museum Club. The Museum Club is a group of students from all different majors and backgrounds who share a common interest in art, visual culture, and of course, museums. The group meets once a week and acts as a bridge between the museum and campus. If you would like to learn more, please visit our page on the Hood Museum's website. This evening, we are joined by two distinguished alumni who will speak about their careers as a gallery owner and an art lawyer. My name is Sam Freed. I am a Dartmouth 22, majoring in art history and history, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Alumni in the Arts Committee, along with Abby Smith 23. I will be one of the moderators for our program and will be joined by two other student moderators, Phoebe and Hadley, who will be facilitating the prepared question portion of the event. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Phoebe Kong. I'm a 21 here at Dartmouth. I'm a studio art major, English yeah. minor, and a, and a member of uh, Museum Club's Alumni and the Arts Committee. Hi folks, my name is Hadley Dietrich. I'm a 22 here at Dartmouth. Uh, I'm majoring in art history and economics, uh, and I'm a member of Museum Club and a curatorial intern at The Hood. Before we begin, we do have a couple of reminders. Um, this evening's discussion will run for about an hour and consist of two sections. In the first, Phoebe and Hadley will deliver a series of questions to the panelists. And then in the second part, I will field Q&A from the audience. At any point during the event, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A feature rather than the chat. We strongly encourage you to ask any questions you may have about art galleries, law as it relates to the art world, or Karen and Hugh's individual experiences. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible in the second half of the program. We do ask that you please refrain from using the raise your hand feature during the webinar. And please also note that this program is being recorded and we will share the link on the Hood Museum's social media platforms in the coming days. Now we would like to introduce the speakers for this evening's discussion. Our first panelist is Karen Brobin, a member of Dartmouth's class of 86. Karen opened up a gallery with her husband, John Lee, in Soho in 1991. In 2006, expanding upon the conventional gallery. Oh, sorry. Okay, he, he muted. Good. Um, they opened Brobin Lee programs in Chelsea, New York. Uh, to exhibit artists and collaborate with colleagues and institutions on a project by project basis. Robin Lee curates several offsite shows and public art installations. They produce limited edition rugs, sculptural editions, and they privilege the medium of the artist book and their artist book program. Karen is currently on the Arts Advisory Committee for the Sterner Arts Tale in Eastern Pennsylvania and curator for the Public Arts Com Commission of Lewis, Delaware. I had the pleasure of interning for Robin Lee programs during my off term of winter 2019. Thank you for that, Phoebe. Um, our second panelist is Hugh Freund, a member of Dartmouth's class of 1967 and a partner at the law firm Patterson, Belknap, Webb and Tyler. His focus ranges from real estate and art law to estate planning and general personal representation. Additionally, Hugh runs an art law practice that represents private and public art galleries, dealers in both the primary and secondary art markets, visual artists and collectors. Hugh has previously served two terms on the Hopkins Center and Hood Museum of Art Board of Advisors, and he enjoys collecting paintings, drawings, sculpture, and photography by young contemporary artists and has donated a number of pieces to the Hood. Thank you, Hadley. Uh, so thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to kick off the uh, question series um, of the webinar. Um, I will now pose a series of questions about your respective experiences navigating different careers in the arts. I think the audience would be interested to know how you each got to your current positions in the field. Also, how did your experience at Dartmouth shape your career? What skills did you gain from your undergraduate experience that helped you in your first few years post-grad? Um, Karen, would you like to go first and then Hugh? Sure. sure. Um, so, uh, to start out with, and, and here I was, I grew up in Manhattan and obviously went to museums and galleries, but it wasn't until I took an art history class with Joy Kenseth that I fell in love with it. And I didn't even think about it until a as a major until someone that was older than me said they majored in art history. And it was like light bulbs went off for me um, in a big way. And I loved my art history classes. And then I did the LSA in Siena, and when I went to um, 
you know, when it was like break time, I visited Venice, Italy. And I said, I said to my friend, I said, I'm coming back here. And I came back as an intern for the Guggenheim that worked at the Biennale. And so Dartmouth really launched that love for me. I have to be honest in terms of when I was looking for a job, um, the alumni, it wasn't what it is today at all. Uh, the alumni network wasn't you know, the, and there was no social media, there was no email, there was nothing. So, um, you know, I watched my friends go through corporate recruiting and wear their, their suits and um, get jobs and it, it was tough. So I, um, I volunteered, I volunteered for an alternative um, program called White Columns that helps young artists get off the ground and taught me how to curate and how to look at work and how to go through boxes and boxes of slides. And then I, I got the first job and that was at the front desk of a gallery and then the second job no an internship you know just sort of went on like that until you know I I met my husband and we opened a gallery together and it was really his gallery at first but it quickly changed I guess I'll go I'll pass the baton <laughs> You're muted, Hugh. Sorry, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute that. Okay, how's that? Much okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be on the call with you all. I was a class of 67. Uh, we didn't have a Hood Museum back then or anything close to that. And um, I majored in regular history and took just as many courses in art history after I was, um, took a general survey course by professional uh, Professor Lathrop. And then I took many other courses and ended up my senior year writing a, uh, taking a seminar on Picasso um, with a professor in his thirties, John Wilmerding, who ended up being one of the great professors in art history across the country and ended his career really at, at Princeton. Um, and I always had an interest in art, but um, it, it didn't lead me uh, immediately out of, uh, out of college directly to be involved with it. I, the Vietnam War was going on. I went to law school and uh, there was no such thing as art law back then. Um, there were art galleries and of course uh, auction houses, but there wasn't a real art market as it is today. There were great collectors. Art wasn't a, an asset class as an investment back then, or nobody thought it uh, as such. And people collected art because they truly loved art. And, um, and I went to law school and then uh, serendipitously uh, started at a law firm that represented uh, all of the Brooklyn uh, not-for-profit institutions, including the Brooklyn Museum and the, Brook and the Children's Museum of Art. And, um, and after about three years of that, I realized I really couldn't make a living as a exempt organization lawyer. So I moved over to a firm where I stayed for 28 years, primarily with uh, doing real estate and investment type work for individual clients. And, and that was the beginning where I spent almost all of my professional career representing uh, individuals in whatever they do. And they could be investors or art collectors or something else. And to, to be completely candid with all of you, I truly hated law school. And if you had told me that on an uninterrupted basis, I had spent 50 years practicing law and having a wonderful time, you could have knocked me over like a feather in 1972. And it just turned out that I found out a lot about myself by being involved with individuals and ultimately with uh, uh, business as well as estate planning and art, that it's a serendipitous path sometimes where you get involved by chance and then you run with it a little bit and it builds into something you never really expected. Um, in my, the, the way I became involved with art law and art law, let me just add is, it, it, it's a great term, except that it involves a lot of other legal things like contracts and leases and litigation and copyright and 
um, uh, a myriad of what would normally be characterized as what a lawyer does every day. And the way I really got involved in it professionally was I uh, have been interested in art and especially contemporary art for a long time. And I fell in love with a show by Bryce Marden in the mid um, seventies. And I was so bowled over by it. I really said I would like to uh, buy one. And I walked in to what was then called Biker Gallery and um, Klaus Curtis, who owned it along with a man named Jeff Byers, neither was there, but there was a 20 year old receptionist by the name of Mary Boone. And Mary helped me buy a couple of pieces. And about two years later, she said, I wanna form my own gallery and I wanna raise a certain amount of money from a group of collectors and I wanna go in business uh, for myself and represent artists I, I respect. And so that started um, uh, work with her and uh, she, she has had quite a, a story over her lifetime and uh, I've continued to represent her and it's involved setting up a gallery, raising money, doing securities work. It was not necessarily art related, um, but uh, that was how I first got started. And then I also represented artists for a while, but my firm got big enough where I couldn't afford, they, they weren't interested in taking an exchange of art for legal fees. So uh, the artist side of my represent, representation has gone by the boards. And I, what I now do for the most part is represent um, galleries, collectors, um, uh, individuals. And in some cases I've represented artists on public commissions and I've represented um, major real estate developers such as Goldman Sachs when they do a commission of a major mural and things like that. So that's how I've ended up where I am. So my practice is primarily, it's still individual representation and a lot of it has to do with estate planning for collectors and getting to know their collections and how they can deal with either giving it away or selling them and it involves dealing with the auction houses, private dealers, public dealers and and mostly contractual uh, arrangements. Well, thank you both for sharing these really great stories. I, I know that I personally always appreciate hearing how professionals in the art world navigated their early, uh, the early stages of their careers. Um, next, I think that the audience might be curious to know what advice you might give to students interested in, in um, both of your respective um, career fields. Um, Hugh, would you like to begin this time? Um, sure. I, I think you have to uh, deal with what your interests are, which change, of course, over time. So what it might be when you're a senior at Dartmouth, uh, most likely is going to morph into something. One, if you're focused on being a doctor and want to be a doctor, you probably should go in that direction. But for me, I really didn't know what I was going to do. And my advice often is for somebody, unless you do know what you're going to do, um, get a job, test it out, uh, basically use your common sense to figure out what you might like to do. If you don't wanna be an investment banker, certainly don't go to Goldman Sachs or Smith Barney. But if, you, if you're interested in an art field or wanna be a teacher, um, go with it. And I think as you go along and get older, you have to continue to understand yourself as to what your continuing interests are, whether you can afford to do what you're going to do, um, and, and never fear uh, speaking with other people about it and drawing on their experiences. Because what I've learned personally for myself is one of the nicest things about helping shape your own career is the people you meet along the way and who you work with. And um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult environment at the moment to do that other than doing it on social media. But I learned about myself because I was the oldest of my generation in my family. And uh, so I didn't have older brothers. I didn't, I had loving parents, but they were in different careers or uh, occupations. And I, I, found out that uh, there was a circle of non-family members that I, 
I could count on to be candid and, and help me sort out where I wanted to go and what was important. And then ultimately you come back to yourself and you have to run some risks in life to make changes. Um, I'll just use one example and then I'll let Karen go. But I really, um, when I took my first job in a small law firm representing the Brooklyn Charities, about three, those were, for me in those days, people took jobs and they stayed in jobs. And um, I found that after three years, I looked at myself and said, I don't, I can't make a living of this. I'm not that interested in it. And I went out and kind of formulated what did I want to do. And then I went out and sought it and got friends to make some recommendations. And I took a chance. And um, I had made sure I wasn't, I wasn't married at the time and I could afford to, do, uh, to take a chance. And it turned out to be worthwhile. I've had other friends that, where they've made those changes and it hasn't worked out so well. But you just have to keep, you want to end up in a position where you like what you're doing. And it's really important and it makes up for a lot of other things to be able to get up in the morning, enjoy who you work with, enjoy what you're doing, stimulating yourself and, 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 and finding something you really enjoy. And, and in terms of the art law practice, it was serendipitous. It grew into something I never expected. And, and we then at, at the firm I'm now with Patterson Belknap, it kind of coalesced into an independent group of five of us that are able to work together on a variety of different um, uh, client projects that run the gamut of, of just everything that could be of interest to somebody. With, it's not to say it's all uh, peaches and cream all the time. There's a lot of pressure sometimes and collectors get very aggravated when they, their sales at the auction houses don't go the way they expected. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's not an easy field just because it relates to art at all. And, and it's, it's a business and it's very challenged these days. And part of, I think, what you want to be in a, uh, is be able to help, help your clients and assist them. Um, Karen, sorry. You're muted. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, what he said about serendipity and, and is so important. And I think that led me it, you know, that sort of helped me along. Um, the, the funny thing is, and, and we acknowledged it recently, my first internship was at Mary Boone Gallery, which <laughs> you and my first art purchase as well. So we had our first art purchases from the same, the same woman. Um, and of course, you know, one thing leads to another, but I, I want to skip well, and, and the reason, you know, sort of hearkening back to how Dartmouth led into anything was the D plan, because I could not, you know, galleries pretty much closed down in the summer, and I could not have had an internship with this very prestigious gallery in August. It, it wouldn't have, you know, it would have been boring, first of all, and it wouldn't have, have given me much. Um, and then each person you meet along the way, I mean, she, she didn't pay me at the time, which you know now I know interns. It's it's not a big thing to to have a free internship, um, but she wrote me the most glorious recommendation, and and that was really worth everything. It got me an internship at the Met, and it it can, and which was paying. And um, ultimately, you know, when my husband, I'm going to jump ahead a lot of years. My husband and I opened a gallery. We moved it from Soho to one location. We partnered with someone named Jay Gorney. And when that partnership fell apart, I, I, you know, my husband kind of was a little lost and I was a little lost. And I had been involved with a, the parks department as a mother, just, you know, pure, it was Washington Square Park and I gave of my time. And the person that ran that said to me, we're looking for someone in Riverside Park to do a public art project. And I had no experience with public art, but it is something that I felt incredibly passionate about. And I jumped at that chance. And the reason I'm sort of using this as an example is because if, I mean, who would have thought that my basically being on a playground committee for my children was gonna lead to the part of, 
of the art world that I that I love the most. And you know, we're, we've got our hand in a lot of different aspects of the art world um, because we call ourselves, instead of a gallery, we call ourselves programs. And we call ourselves programs because after so many years in the art world, we did not just want to have exhibitions and just sort of be pigeonholed into that. We, we had these different interests. I had public art. My husband was very interested in starting um, more of an additions situation. And now we're, we're working on something completely different. That's an online platform for um, donating to museums, which, so if it weren't for the ability to, to have one person lead you to the next person, speak to everybody, be involved, volunteer if you're allowed, you know, if, if your, your economic situation can allow you to do so, even volunteer on a quick project or a two week event, then you're meeting more people. Let's say that there's an art fair and they need somebody for the one week of the art fair. Think about how many people you will meet during that time that could open you up to the next the next person and the next person. And it's sort of serendipity. You kind of go rolling along as, as, you, as you do it. Um, All right, thank you both for really um, such valuable advice there. Um, I'd like to move on to what I consider a very timely question that all of us are really curious about. Um, Hugh touched on it a little bit already. How have your fields changed because of COVID and how do you think the pandemic will have a lasting effect on your professions and, all, and on the greater art world and industry? Um, Karen, would you like to go first again? Sure, um, it hugely affected our business. Um, we were about to have an opening and, um, you know, we really rely on our openings for a lot of visitors that, you know, we it can be dribs and drabs. We're not on the ground floor. We used to be when we had a partnership with Jay Gorney, but we're on the second floor and our openings are everything for us. So we canceled the opening. We canceled the show that led into summer. We just opened for two weeks a show and we we had to take, we took um, reservations. Um, the sales have completely slowed down. And we've, you know, as I said, that when we started this Robin Lee programs, we just weren't, we didn't feel we just had to have a gallery. And so we've been thinking, do we need a space? And it's, it's hard, it's very hard to give up something you've had since 1991. We're not sure yet. We're still thinking about it. We've got a show coming up, um, you know, in December. But because we do, we we do um, limited edition rugs with um, artists, artists with with really um, big names, not like our young emerging program. We we've created rugs with artists called Christopher Wool and Jonas Wood, and artists that show often with big galleries like Pace and Gagosian, and we don't need to have a gallery to do it. Um, I've been looking for another public art program, another public art situation. And believe it or not, this morning, I got a call that, you know, could be something really nice for me to sink my teeth into. And I don't need a gallery to have, to be able to do that. And the online donation platform that we're working on, again, we don't need to have our space. And so as COVID, you know, has taken over, we're really rethinking. Um, it's hard. We're really rethinking what we want to do. We're at home, four of us. And my daughter's 24. My son is 21. Um, we have Zoom calls going in every room. And my daughter, who's 24, is was an art history major at Kenyon. And if she's a fine artist, and then she is also um, a theatrical um, makeup artist. And she was at Juilliard um, working until the pandemic hit. And she's frustrated and she wants a regular job now. She's, we're talking, and I said, you, you had one of those, like she worked for an art institution called Exhibition A and she, she hated it. And I so fear that this virus will force her to make a choice 
and I'm trying to encourage her not to make the choice just for the job because we're willing to give her the opportunity to wait through this. Um, and I feel so, must be so hard for all of you students who are, you know, missing school and missing, you know, job opportunities. Um, it's, you know, and hopefully your parents are saying to you, like I said to my daughter, like, don't take something just that you will regret, you know, try, try to, try to hold out. And with social media, um, you know, I, as soon as COVID hit, I started a little online social media thing for um, artwork under $800. And I just thought how, and I worked with artists that weren't even our regular artists that we've worked with. And it was going like gangbusters. I mean, it, you know, we were selling and selling and artists were reaching out to me. They were excited that, you know, someone was giving them a platform. And then um, that when Black Lives Matter happened, um, I pulled back and the art world pulled back because then it wasn't quite about let's sell and let's get through this pandemic. It was about something else altogether. So um, the summer really kind of was like a one two punch in terms of um, sales, but we'll, we'll see what's next. So uh, we haven't made a decision yet. So my, my experience was really secondhand because my firm was, I wasn't, but my firm was a very virtual firm because of the litigation they do. And mo most court cases have gone from sh schlepping around a lot of paperwork to having it all online and in the cloud. So I was probably the least prepared of uh, 200 lawyers because I'm just not that facile on, on the computer. But the firm was and have helped me through it. And basically what I dealt with, not personally uh, and, and firm wise, but through clients, um, especially in the art world, because the first thing that happened, of course, was, you know, sales did dry up, just like Karen's been discussing. How do you pay your rent? How do you pay your mortgage? How do you pay your artists? How do you pay your employees? And in the first couple of months of, from March to probably early June, I probably spent an inordinate amount of time dealing with leasing situations where landlords who in Chelsea and some other fancy locations who have been lucky to have wonderful galleries and others as their clients for years and paying a lot of rent, all of a sudden said, we have no business and we can't pay the rent. And in almost all of the landlord situations we dealt with, they were completely ununderstanding of what the gallery owners faced. Um, first of all, they didn't, the ones I had to deal with, um, never believed that the art world wasn't picking up and that sales weren't being made. Um, and it took in a situation where I had four galleries that had the similar, same landlord the lawyer who said he was familiar with the art world and he knew there were private sales going on. And I said, honestly, there's nothing going on. It's completely shut down. And after about, it took four months of negotiations to come to some kind of settlement that in their situation, it was some forgiveness of rent and they ended up you know, paying a certain percentage and all of those transactions, you know, back in April, you say, okay, let it go for nine months. We'll solve this problem. Well, we haven't solved the real problem, which is the medical problem. And we haven't solved the problem allowing people to come back in the galleries and the fact that there's no restaurant business or anything else. So here we are, we're going to face this again early next year on renegotiations with a bunch of landlords who are saying, you have to pay your rent because we can't pay our mortgage. And so that was kind of my how I got thrown right into it. And of course they had that act that was passed about personnel and subsidizing them. And that had its own complexities. So you know, those were the, the, the PPP problem, the payroll, uh, personnel payroll program was a great idea, but not only did uh, it was very complex, nobody knew, including the government employees administering what it meant. So it was like everybody was working together 
to survive and understand. And that changed the course of a lot of people's practice. And what um, the, the next thing that happened in terms of where our law practice went, less so me than others in my firm, was how do the galleries get back into a business? And how do they get their works out there? How do auction houses deal with it? And I think kind of extraordinary in the industry has been the fact that people have really coped, in my opinion, extraordinarily well to getting a sense of business back. And how do you go on social media? How do you have auctions online? How do galleries set up media programs and interviews with artists all online? And then can, can you make that work to the point of supporting yourself? And one of the sidelights of, uh, of, of COVID to me has been how sophisticated many of these programs are, but also I, for one who always went to the art fairs, I, I, that's completely changed. Nobody's going to art fairs. And in many gallery situations, especially medium-sized ones, when they started to look at their budgets, they could cut a million dollars out of their budget by not going to every art fair around the world and shipping art and moving five employees over there and paying hotel rooms. So to some degree, there has been a serious adjustment. And then your focus is, well, what are you doing going forward? And I get involved in you know, ha advising people on how you, you you cope with this and the copyright issues and the media issues uh, and then the renegotiating lease situations and then also dealing with, with uh, financing institutions that may have loans outstanding. So it, it, COVID has affected me less personally than professionally because you're dealing with someone else's issues and the, uh, their employment law issues for people who had to you know, fire employees. And on top of that, you have the issues in our practice. Uh, you, you have, a, I'll take off on Karen's comment about Black Lives Matter. Look at the controversies going on with, with the major museums in the country right now. And they're on the front page. They're letting people go. There's discriminate, discrimination claims of how curators are treated and uh, sexual harassment. And so what looks like an art law practice ends up is like a general corporate practice just focused more on a different type of clientele. But the issues are all the same as is the case law and, and how important it is um, of what you're reading on the front pages of the Times and the art sections. Thank you both for that. It really does sound like you know, we're going through a time with that demands tough decisions and creative thinking. Um, I think we're gonna shift gears a little bit here and ask some more specific questions. And uh, I'll kick it back to you, Hugh. Um, which came first for you, an interest in art or an interest in law? And from where did these interests stem from? Um, it was 100% in art. I really, if I hadn't needed to defer um, uh, going into the service, I would um, have probably said, I'll either go to business school or law school, but it was not my high interest. I, I honestly really didn't think much about it um, when I was an undergraduate until I had to, which with that war, it was, I had to start thinking about it in, in, in junior year. And, um, and I, I applied to both business school and law school, and uh, I can't give a good reason why I chose one over the other. I, I don't regret it, but it was kind of like a, a, a coin toss. And uh, I, I wasn't really um, enthusiastic about either one. I don't think I had honestly had a real sense of myself. Um, and I don't know whether it was the environment or me personally or whatever, but you know, off I went. And um, if I had looked back on it, I probably would have said I could have used a year off to figure that out, but I didn't have that choice at the time in terms of whether to go in the service or go to graduate school. And that's, I just selected law school. And the interest in law and art was purely, not professionally, but it was just, I, I always liked um, 
uh, going to museums and interested in it. I didn't think I was going to end up with an art law council position, but that's it, it, there was no question in my mind it was more about law than it was, uh, you know, my interest was in art from, um, from a personal point of view, but um, it, there wasn't an issue about me going to graduate school to be a teacher or a curator or anything else. Great, uh, thank you, Hugh. Um, now we're gonna send a question over to Karen. You touched a little bit um, on this already, but what is the process for starting a gallery? Um, how did you receive the funding? And also how did you kind of carve out your niche to fill? Um, did you go into the gallery world already having a specific niche or um, as you mentioned before, you, you took some turns along the way, but um, yeah, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, I don't, as I was working for galleries, I had always, the intention was for me to have my own gallery. And I hadn't, I was only, you know, 25, had no idea how I might do that. Um, I didn't have an investor and I wasn't in that place yet. Um, and while I was working for a gallery that subsequently closed is when I met my husband. And I'm very lucky because he had, he had been a private dealer and his family was going to be funding that. So I did not have to do um, what Mary Boone and other people had to do and, and look for funders. Um, that being said, you know, <laughs> it's tough to be working with your family's money and, um, and struggling, you know, while you do. Um, so we opened a gallery together on the 10th floor of a building on Broadway and we didn't have a, a niche yet. We just wanted to show some great young art and sort of hit, you know, hit, hit the ground running. Um, and then we moved to a much bigger space on the ground floor in Soho. And when we did, um, Soho was beginning to turn into a mall and we were beginning to be priced out of our, of our space. And we were having kids and um, we didn't have another investor to turn to, um, but we were selling all right. And then we sold our lease back to the um, it's now Old Navy, our space. Um, and we sold our lease back. That gave us a little cushion to weather the weather, the storm um, between spaces. And then we partnered with another dealer and we took a huge space on the ground floor and we showed relatively prominent artists. Um, and I raised my kids more or less while that gallery with it was very top heavy. We hired a young director, my husband was involved, our partner Jay Gorney was involved. Um, and when that partnership ended, which is roughly when I told you that I started doing the public art, we decided actually to create our first niche and that was to show works on paper. We were gonna move the gallery to the second floor we didn't want to stop having a gallery, but we didn't feel that we could go go back to showing big, powerful names um, that we had been when we had a partner. So our niche was works on paper and it was great. Um, we were able to show artists from other galleries because sometimes their works on paper were being overlooked. Our first show was an artist Tom Naskowski, who um, we had a good relationship with. And so this existed for several years. Um, we went to art fairs. We got accepted a lot of art fairs because we were a works on paper gallery. We had a new um, position. However, what happens when you have works on paper and they're not your primary artist is you put a boatload of money into the framing. And then when the show is done, what you haven't sold you paid for the friend. It just ended up being a very costly enterprise. And so we started to, that's when we sort of, we tried to come up with a new niche. I mean, we've definitely, you know, we've moved spaces many times. We've recreated ourselves many times. We've got the public art, the online platform. Now we're basically nicheless with, with many different aspects to what we do. And um, I think it allows us, we're both in our, you know, well, he's 61 and I'm, in my 50s. I think it allows us to enjoy our job more without feeling like we need to stay in that niche. 
And I just wanted to sort of dovetail back to something Hugh said when he was talking about art galleries and the expenses, um, I mean, art fairs. Those ended up being great for selling, but then you become a slave to working, to, to doing an art fair. We really are a mom and pop shop. And the art fairs, they're, I, to me, and I don't know what's gonna happen after COVID, but there's a little bit of a silver lining. I don't know, I don't wanna call it a silver lining, but the art fairs were taking over the gallery world and making it almost impossible to be able to afford because you had to keep up and you had to do another one. And, oh, you're not going to Chicago and you're going to this. And um, that's something, I hope that there's less art fairs. And so that if there are, if people do start going back to galleries, that that one-on-one -on -one experience with art in a room, a solo show, or even a small group show where you can, where you're not um, competing for all the attention of all the collectors that walk by. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a little bit of a silver lining. Thank you for that, Karen. Um, last question, uh, this one's for Hugh in our, in our prepared section. So as someone who works with collectors and artists and all sorts of institutions in the art world, um, what is the biggest mistake that you've found can land people in court? Uh, lying and cheating. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just go back to um, my first art client and Karen's first employer, Mary Boone. Um, it's an example that for all of you that either know or don't know, she ended up in jail for tax evasion. Um, and uh, it's, um, I, I was not personally involved and didn't even know about it until ultimately at the very end of where she had agreed that she caused herself a problem. Um, especially when there's no need for, she was very, is, was and is very successful. She had a wonderful life, family and everything else. I don't know what happened, but um, I'm, I'm a believer that lying and cheating, ultimately get, you get caught up in it. Um, and, you know, part of what's, what you learn about yourself, or at least I did in terms of, of uh, my practice and especially representing individuals and in whatever they do, and it's a broad range of not just business, but personal is doing your homework and being able to advise a client um, honestly, directly, unemotionally as possible about a course of action when they're faced with certain situations in their life. Some of them can be great and some of them can be terrible. And, um, and, and I, I, I look back on my career and it was easier for me for many years just to muff the question and just pass on it and say, I'll get back to you and I didn't get back to them or whatever it was because those kind of discussions are really difficult, but that's what you as a professional in, in, in what you're doing um, have to deal with is you're advising someone else and you have to be honest about it, have done your homework and give them as best direct advice as possible. And, um, and, and I truly believe whatever you do, uh, you, if it's if it's not good ethically or morally or legally, you get caught, and it's like cheating somehow on an exam. And it you know to me, it's your life, it's your career, it's your reputation, and in a community, and it just isn't. It honestly isn't worth it. And if it's a if you're faced with the choice, just don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, I've had clients that. Um, that would skate right up to that edge in terms of how they would push their position. It could be a tax position, it could be a nego business negotiation, but ultimately I, th they as the client would not go over that edge. And I've always had a rule that if you think your position is here's the line and the person goes over it, you don't wanna be involved with that person. And no matter how much you can make or win or lose or whatever. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it to yourself. You have to wake up in the morning and say, I can't represent this person. I can't take that position. Um, and uh, the, the only other thing that I would, I would say is 
um, that make sure that whatever you write, uh, you've read it a couple of times. And if you're giving advice, read it again and make sure that it's one understandable and it's not confusing to whoever's on the other side, because I guarantee with the written word, if somebody can uh, interpret it differently than what you think it says, they will. And it's just kind of a good check on yourself because sometimes mistakes can be that made, made that way as well. I'll keep those top of mind. No lying, <laughs> no cheating, proofread. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you both so much for sharing these insights with us. I'm sure I can speak for everyone when I say that we really do love learning about um, both of, uh, your times at Dartmouth and the uh, careers that you have both embarked upon. Um, and we will turn it over to Sam to pose some questions from the audience. So Sam, take it away. Hi, I also wanted to say thank you for your answers so far. I have also found them pretty enlightening. Um, just as a reminder to the audience, we are accepting questions via the Q&A function. We actually have one already. It is directed to Karen. Um, and the question is, how do you approach curating public art projects? And what do you believe the role of public art is? Okay. Um, so, each public art project that I've been able to do, you know, you have to take into consideration who your, not only who your client is, but who your, who your art viewers are. Um, so the first project, which I did was in Riverside Park um, for the anniversary of a conservancy, we wanted we wanted the viewers to be surprised by installations that they didn't expect. And that's my favorite kind of public art. It's not just a sculpture in the middle of a plaza, although I like that too, but it's that you come upon something unexpected. Um, maybe it's an installation or something that, you know, makes you, you know, question why it's there, what the art is and think about the space in a different way than you never thought about before. Um, when I did a project for the Downtown Alliance, which is a business improvement district um, in Wall Street area, it was after 9-11 and it was to basically dress up the, uh, the, the concrete barriers and the construction barriers. And so I had to keep in mind that what they were looking for was I hate the word, but I'll call it whimsy, but something attractive and something something beautiful and not just, it could be deeply thought provoking, but um, but something that was going to brighten the day of the people that had to walk through that area every day. And I really think that the role of public art is, I think it's very, I think what's called placemaking is very important. Um, you can take a garage, an empty garage, and if you've outdoor garage and if you've created something in there and put in benches you've created a plaza you've created a place for people to convene to talk about the art and there's a lot of really crappy public art um, but in my mind a piece of public art that forces people that have never even thought about art or a gallery or a museum but it's out there in the public for them to actually talk about it's done its job even if it's not the greatest piece in the world Cool, thank you. Um, our next audience question is for Hugh. And this person asked, um, any advice for young artists on legally protecting their work or how do you protect yourself in the early stages of your career? Um, they also asked, is it worth taking people to court if your work is damaged, et cetera? Um, well, you, it, with protecting your work, you wanna make sure whether it's most importantly copyrighted um, and that's, that's very easy to do with your little C with a circle and your name and a date. So it should be on every piece of your artwork. Um, although, you know, if you didn't have it, there's a thing called common law copyright. So you could be protected. It just gets, uh, uh, it, it's just definitely worth making sure you have something like that because people, what, what's happened in so much of, um, art these days is the multimedia aspect to it. So I just had a case with a, an artist, um, this is the second one I've had, it. the span was 30 years between them where 
an artist took a photograph uh, and did a fantastic drawing of it uh, that it didn't look like a photograph, but it was an exact representation of the image. And the photographer hired his lawyer and came after the artist and claimed copyright infringement, which there was no question about. I asked the artist, did you know? And he, he just was unaware of the legal issue there. And the fact that he made a handmade drawing didn't make him safe and sound from making an exact copy of a photograph. Um, and uh, so it, the issue about whether you go to court over it, in this case, you didn't have to go to court. You needed a intellectual property lawyer, someone to do copyright and trademark. Um, and there are nonprofit law firms that represent artists or represent individuals in certain cases. And you could go to them and say, I have a copyright infringement case and they'll write the letter, it's pro bono. So you can have an advocate without spending a lot of money on it. And in terms of whether you wanna to go to court or not, that, that is an issue that one sometimes just can be resolved easily by a letter and maybe monetary damages, maybe not. Something to recompense the person that is infringing your work, but don't threaten litigation easily because it's very expensive and most, and you don't want to risk some kind of court sanction if a judge says that's just a nefarious claim. It's not worth bringing. Um, so you have to weigh it as you as the client who feels infringed, whatever it may be, you, you want a counselor that can just tell you the pluses or minuses, different courses of action. And um, are you able to resolve it, sorry, um, uh, amicably without spending a lot of money in court? Court is not to be uh, resorted to easily because what seems like a simple case, I can guarantee you often becomes a true nightmare. And you just can't change your mind three weeks later and say, well, I'm not doing that because all of a sudden you've got somebody on the other side who's hired a lawyer and, and has spent the money and then wants something back from you. Cool, thank you, Hugh. Um, our questions from the audience seem to be fairly well balanced between the two of you. I think we have time for two more questions, um, but this one is for Karen. Um, and the question is, can those of us who can't afford to volunteer get into the art world, say by waiting for, for a paid internship? I definitely want to address this one because, um, you know, back when I was doing that, there wasn't the internet. And so finding out about the availability of paid internships, it, it was near impossible. Um, but today there are websites that can help um, in the search. One is NYFA, New York, New York Federation of the Arts, NYFA. Um, there's, and they have job postings. I, I look all the time on there and there are many paid internships because nowadays internships are more often paid than not. It's um, even if it's nominal. Um, bigger galleries, smaller galleries just can't do it. And then there's another website called American Federation of the Arts uh, that will help. And something that I talk about all the time actually with my husband is that with the use of social media, you can already be a dealer, a gallerist in a way. You can create a niche and start posting you can reach people that you never reached before. Um, you could start a blog, you can start your career and not make money <laughs> by doing it, but while you're sitting at home during COVID, you can create something that you can put out there and start to connect to people and write to people. I'm, I'd like to post your image, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curating a theme, whatever it is, um, you have more, options than than we had um and i think that you know that's important um and you asked me if you should wait for a paid internship i'm i'm sort of suggesting sure but but don't wait and do nothing wait and 
create something or get, you know, connect, just connect to people out, out there on, on that. And, um, you know, the biggest tool you all have that we didn't have was Google. And, you know, a friend of mine taught a class and he would go to his class and he would go to the students. They were, it was called principles of gallery management. And he would say, who has Googled me? And none of them had. And I, I think for us as, as older people, it's such a, it's such an incredible tool that you're not even aware of and keep Googling, keep looking for opportunities because there's, there's more out there than, you know, just, I, I cold called Mary Boone gallery. And I said to her, are you looking for interns? And she said to me, <laughs> she said, did you just pick me because I was the first in the alphabet? And of course I was 21 and completely taken aback when she said that. And then I said, no, no, I read an article on Metropolitan Home about you. And then she said, oh, that article was full of factual errors. What was I gonna say to that? But um, I just told you that as a sort of anecdote of how hard it was to look for a non-paying internship. You got her voice down just perfect. Yeah, there. well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, so before I pose the final question for the evening, apologies, we probably will run over by a couple of minutes. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone to please fill out the survey that will be placed in the chat. It will also be emailed out tomorrow. Um, now I think the final question is interesting, so worth having you guys both briefly answer it, even though we might go a little bit over, but how do you guys see the art world changing going forward? And how do you think the next generation of artists and art professionals fit into that changing landscape? Um, <laughs> oh, thanks, Karen. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm trying to be positive about what everybody's going through and the art world I think is going to change as are a lot of businesses because it's going to be clearly a much uh, different environment uh, for a while at least. I mean, you could pose that question as to what the future of cities are too <laughs> and schools. And um, I'm trying to be positive about it and take what I've seen with the galleries so far in the art world that, that there is going to be an online serious part of all of this that Will, will I think last no matter what. Um, frankly, I hope between, as Karen has said about the art fairs, I did too. I, I don't need to go to that many art fairs, if any. Um, there is something that you miss on the socialization side, um, just of society in general. We're all kind of isolated. And I miss that part of it. I don't miss thousands of people looking at art and the poor dealers running frazzled. So the online aspect, I think, is going to be continuing to be important. The art world is still here. You know, galleries are surviving. Collectors do buy. Um, I'm worried that younger artists are going to have a really, really tough time uh, selling art. Um, it's going to be very hard for galleries to survive if they don't have kind of what I call institutional uh, group of collectors that have been their customers for a long time. Um, you often would see in Chelsea people just roaming the streets and going into galleries one after another. That's just not happening. Um, and I hope, you know, the city survives as well. I think it will, but it's going to be different and it's going to take time. And um, it's going to be a real challenge for, uh, I think, artists to survive and galleries to survive. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to stay positive about it because I, I, in, in all of what we're going through, I think the arts, and I don't mean just the, the gallery museum uh, world, I think the arts are gonna be really critical for society in the next many years. Um, they're gonna be in a different form and whether it's museums or music or dance, it is really important that we have creativity for our society to sustain ourselves. We just can't go have a job, have a family and not have outside interests and just always worried. So there has to be a spiritual side. And I look at art as, as what helps me get through when I have to walk outside or do something to get out of my office. 
And if I, I just wanted to, I thought of something else I just wanted to say, because if I don't have a chance later is two things. Um, and I don't know how many of you read hard copy newspaper or print, but I suspect it's a lot less than I do. I happen to get hard copy newspapers every day. And there's a lot, and, and I've compared the online versions of whether it's the Times or the Journal or the Financial Times. There are articles about the arts that just aren't there and you miss them online. And to the extent that you feel like picking up the Financial Times, which is a British paper on the weekend, that's a start, but also sometimes pick up the art section hard copy and go look for what's in it because it's easy to miss. Um, really interesting articles, whatever it may be. It could be movies, um, film, gallery work. And the second thing I'd suggest to all of you because you're an art club is there's been a very interesting discussion about a Philip Guston show that was a retrospective. And I don't know if all of you followed it, but they put it off from its opening for four years and there was such a clamor at, that it will come back in two years and it circles around his depiction of the Ku Klux Klan. And I think it's a really interesting discussion problem to deal with. I was, I would have had that show in a minute just because I think it was really well curated and probably really well written about and I think the curators and the museums chickened out on it. And I think they backed off a little bit. But I, if, if you can get an article on explaining that case and the issues and getting the commentary from a variety of curators and public officials, I think it's really worth reading from an intellectual point of view and an art perspective as well. OK, I'll shut up. <laughs> um, okay. You are gonna ask me the same question, that same question. Um, he, I'm not gonna answer it as it relates to COVID or the, the climate right now. I'm just gonna answer that. I think that the art world was already undergoing a huge change um, it, where it used to be like you had a gallery, an auction house and a museum. I think that the lines were beginning to be blurred a little bit. Um, you used to have a gallery that would represent, let's say, 10 to 12 artists. Uh, you, you stuck with those artists. All the walls were coming down um, between the, the various institutions and, and what was sort of more like where there were sort of rules that was being broken down as well. And, you know, as I said, again, the internet changed that, but where before you may not have been able to be taken seriously if you did a pop-up show in an open space in the middle of Times Square because you were supposed to be in Soho or Chelsea. Those barriers have come down. People have opened galleries in Harlem and, um, you know, the Flower District. All of that is where I saw until COVID happened that 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 was the, what the biggest change I was noticing. And it was a great one because it basically meant it's all there for the sort of taking. You can try whatever you want without fear of repercussion because you weren't doing it the right way. So that's my response to that one. Great, well, thank you so, so much to Karen and Hugh for taking the time to so thoughtfully answer our questions and provide valuable guidance to those interested in the arts. Um, thank you as well to our wonderful audience for asking such engaging questions. As a reminder, there will be a recording of this webinar post on the Hood social media. We will also be emailing a very short two minute survey tomorrow. It's also in the chat. Um, we would really appreciate your feedback on this experience to help inform future programming. Um, and have a great weekend, everyone.